So I'll be curious to see the reaction to my review of AEW All Out. Because the WWE sheep are going to be mad at me for saying some good things about this show. And the AEW neckbeard fanboys are going to be raging against me with their flaming keyboard fingers of fire. Because I don't sit there and praise this show effusively and splooge all over the camera and the keyboard here. You know, if anything else, I could serve, I hope, one purpose when talking about all elite wrestling and their product and their shows. Giving you a largely unbiased, non-cuck viewpoint. Because, by God, I can tell we're going to need it. And of all of the things that help illustrate this, nothing does a better job than that of last night as you're getting ready for the main event. The Young Bucks cuck himself, Dave Meltzer, tweeted, and he has tweeted a lot of dumb wrestling opinions and a lot of dumb wrestling takes over the years. But this, by God, has to rank up there as one of, if not the single worst takes he has had in his four decades of covering professional wrestling. I'm paraphrasing here, but it's close enough to reality to get to the point. He said last night that unless Jericho goes out and has one of the best matches of his career and Hangman Page has the best match of his career, that the Lucha Brothers Young Bucks ladder match should have main evented this show. Does anybody else understand just how ridiculous and biased that sounds? Like, I don't even think, Dave, the Bucks of Suck would agree with you. Even though they went out there and actually had a really good match, I almost feel dirty for saying it. The simple fact of the matter is, is they went out there and they did the job, so to speak. Yes, it was a ladder match, but they lost. Like, they know they weren't the main attraction. It is one thing to have friends in the business. It is one thing to have biases in the business. But when you allow it to cloud your better judgment like this, and Meltzer is not just some other person. He's the guy that the vast majority of the other dirt sheets out there rip off their news and their scoops from. He's the guy that all these idiots doing these star ratings have based their stuff off of. He's the guy with 200,000 plus Twitter followers. He's got more followers than the most of the wrestlers that were wrestling on this All Out show. So his opinion carries weight. And when his opinion comes out like this, it could be an anchor, an absolute anchor. How ridiculous is it on a night where a company is going to crown their first world champion that you would want a match other than that main eventing a show? Not to mention the fact that that match that's going to crown that first world champion involves the biggest name that you have in Chris Jericho. So that is strike two on the stupidity factor. And then strike number three above all else on a show where you're crowning your first ever world champion, Dave. You want to sit there and main event a tag title match for belts that belong to another fucking promotion? Are you kidding me? Are you insane? Are you nuts? Or do you enjoy the taint of the Bucks so goddamn much that you go out of your way to show just how much you cook for them? Like, this is about as foolish as people thinking that the whole thing with Alden last year started as a bet and that Meltzer wasn't in on the work. Open your eyes, people. Open your eyes. He's in on all of it. But you can't say dumb stuff like that. That's why you need me. Not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Because while you might not always agree with me, and I'll say plenty of dumb things, I will never say anything that moronic and that stupid and that flat out cuckish, markish bullshit like Dave Meltzer did last night. Give me a break. Anyways, on to the show itself. The pre show. This buy in casino battle royale. Am I the only one that thinks that? This match should have actually been on the main card in at least one or two of the other matches, like the uh, Best Friends of Dark Order match and the uh, Sheeta and Riho match. Maybe could have been on this pre-show instead. I'm just saying. As you had some returning people like ODB, you had a debut like a Mercedes Martinez. You had something going on in this match. Now, granted, I was flat out totally stunned 
Not so much that Nyla Rose won this. I, I think a lot of people probably saw that coming. It was the fact that Kong and Brandy Rhodes were eliminated so early. Where on the last show, if I remember correctly, you did a lot with them and hyped that up that Kong was going to be in Brandy's quarter and so on and so forth. And then here it was pretty much a non-factor. It was just really weird. Um, as far as Nyla Rose winning, I don't know what to think of it. You guys can tell me what you think of it. And the reality is, please keep this in mind as I talk about some of the things on this show. While I'm familiar with some of the names and some of the talents and some of the wrestlers, I'm not familiar with everything. I'm not familiar with everyone. So sometimes if I'm going to ask a question, it is not automatically just assuming that this is Schleg Daddy Snark or that I'm being a smartass. It can sometimes be because I legitimately am trying to understand. If I'm being a smartass or I'm being snarky or I'm trying to cut something down, believe me, you're going to know it. And there will be moments of that in this review. But I mean, I'm just trying to figure out why, why is there such a big urgency to have Nyla Rose win this and assuredly go on to become your first AEW Women's World Champion. I'm sure some of you will have an opinion on it and you probably won't be off the mark. The other match on the pre-show, the Private Party versus Angelico and Jack Evans. I sat there during the match, tweeted, who are these guys? And why should I care? And that's not just meant to be snarky. That's a legitimate question. And that, if anything, is an indictment on the commentators who had their moments on this night where they weren't very good. You're introducing these people to a new audience. Try and tell the story of who they are, what they're about, why this match matters. If it doesn't matter, then it doesn't matter. If they're just guys going out there doing spots, and so be it. But if there's supposed to be more to this, then let there be something more to this by actually bothering to tell me why I should care. The only fun thing to me about this, because otherwise it's just a bunch of random guys doing spots, and we see enough of that in professional wrestling. Not every one of these matches is freaking good, nor necessary. The only thing believable about it was afterwards when the white guys attacked the black men from behind because the black men bothered to win the damn match. These honkies were entitled, by God. They were mad that the black man won. See, that is something that you can understand. That is something that makes sense based off of our current world state of affairs. Everything up to that? Eh. The heel turn? Okay, now you got my attention a little bit. On to the main card. I enjoyed the hell out of this opening match. I'll say this about SCU especially Daniels and Kazarian. They're really solid hands in this type of role. The type of guys that come out there will give you a little pre-match promo, get the crowd into it a little bit. They've got somewhat recognizable names with the type of audience that they're appealing to here. They're going to go out there and have a decent match. It's not going to overshadow everything else on the card, and it's not going to disappoint, and they're going to know what the hell to do. So those are the types of guys that you want to have in that type of spot. But this match was all about the Lucha effing Soros. This guy is money. This guy has box office written all over him. He's monstrous compared to the rest of this damn ro roster. For the most part, he works like a freaking monster, dare I say, like a damn dinosaur. They're not kicks, damn you. They're tail whips. They're tail whips. But you could feel it and you could sense it in the crowd. Like everybody understands, this is somebody different. This is somebody unique. And this was a great spotlight match for him. You could argue the right team went over. The hell with the Jungle Boy and stupid-ass Marco Stunt. I could give a crap less about their vanilla, bland, mayonnaise-looking asses. The Lucha effing Saurus got his moments, got his shine, and the right team won, and they protected him. And that's how this should be done. Give the Lucha effing Soros his shine and protect him at all costs. Because the money you could make off of some of those masks long term alone are going to justify the spot that you should eventually be putting him in. He should be considered someday to be a future AEW World Champion. And if he isn't, then shame on everybody involved with that damn company. Lucha effing Soros FTW for the freaking win. For the win. For the win. It's a tail whip. It's not a kick. Was I the only one though that was surprised at the second match on the main show is Kenny Omega versus Pac? I still gotta get used to saying Pac versus Pac. Sorry, it's just weird to me. Um, yeah, I was a little surprised, but 
seeing as what played out in this match, it actually ended up, I think, kind of making sense why they put this match second on the show, because they knew this was probably going to stun and maybe even disappoint some people. I'll always say this about Pac. You can't help hyped. Can't help looking like a Keebler elf. But what you can help is bothering how to try and be a personality, trying to actually work, and trying to actually look like you give a crap. You hit the gym, you tone your body, you actually do your best to look like a professional wrestler. And I will always respect that dude for that because you have so many other guys that look like me that are in this business that don't work out, that look sloppy and jelly. He cares. And it gives me a reason to care. And as far as Kenny Omega goes, you know, when he slows down like he did in this match, and don't get me wrong, this match was not a masterpiece for either one of them. This was not a true work of art visually. There was some sloppiness and some botchiness. It's not the smoothest operation I've ever seen. But when Omega slows down, and with the stuff that he could do, he actually slows down, and there's at least an illusion of an attempt to try and tell a story. His matches work so much better for me. And I really, really enjoyed the match here. There was a clear-cut heel-face dynamic that you don't get a lot in wrestling anymore, and you most certainly are probably not going to get here with All Elite Wrestling. So when you do get it, you naturally gravitate for it, towards it. And as far as Pac beating Kenny Omega, I thought it was weird where they were talking about Kenny Omega being on this big losing streak because the last time I remember, didn't he win his last pay-per-view match? If you could say he says he's left New Japan, he hasn't been quite the same, then maybe that's the story that you tell. But it's kind of hard to sell the story of he's really struggling when he literally just won the last time I saw him. But Pac winning clearly was a legit surprise, especially considering he was a last-minute stand-in for Moxley. That was a surprise. That was a pleasant surprise. Sometimes a surprise is a surprise, and it doesn't always make it a good one. But in this particular case... I'm like, they, everybody thought it was going one way, and so did I. And they went in an entirely different direction. That was Omega doing good business. That was AEW making a good decision. Because not every finish has to feel and be the exact same. And it was interesting. It got people buzzing. You could hear kind of the hushed, stunned reaction of the audience. Like, that's a quantifiable reaction, too, and it was there. He got close to kind of really disappointing and almost pissing off the fans there live. But for me, it really worked. Unfortunately, though, the next few matches on this card, right there in the middle, really brought this show down for me. That Cracker Barrel Challenge. Darby Allen had two really nice spots. That skateboard spot was outstanding. The back bump that he did onto the steps with the barrel on top of it looked great. But Joey Janela is trash. Seriously, what is his appeal? Why do people like him? What is it that is so special about him? He just looks sloppy. Looks like he doesn't care. The paper cut spots look trash. Maybe you don't see it up close when you're there in person, and I get that. But when they zoom in on it and you're watching it via your Bleacher Report live stream, which is what I did because I'm like a lot of you that are going to complain about this review, I actually bothered spending the $49.99 to try and support this damn company so you could take that and shove it up your ass. But Jimmy Havoc winning, would he screw up not once but twice? This is an example to me. I wonder if Cracker Barrel liked the way that they were incorporated to this match because that gimmick was pounded down everybody's damn throat. Wasting biscuits and barrels and everything else. Hey, if you're going to do it, I guess do it. And at least Cracker Barrel could say they got a good bang for their buck. That said, though, that said, this is just an example of three guys going out there and doing spots and bumping around for 20 minutes. I have seen enough of that in professional wrestling. Part of the purpose of me looking to AEW is to give me something different, something fresh, something new. Not the same crap I'm largely seeing throughout other wrestling companies over the past several years. I don't need random spot fests like this. I do not. Especially when you know you're going to have other spot fests in the show. Better, more well executed, more meaningful spot fest, mind you, in the show. This was a hard no for me, dog. Just like the best friends, I almost said best friends, whatever the hell, they're going to hug it out. 
versus the Dark Order. Like this match, I think everybody can agree, was the worst match on the show, was it not? Like, why should I care about either one of these teams? And they, they were fighting for something. They're going to get a first round buy. But isn't this technically, if they're wrestling each other now for a first round buy, like, can this be classified as a first round match? Just really weird to me. This could have been on the pre-show, and I don't think it would have hurt anybody's feelings. The highlight of it was Orange Cassidy coming out, running with his hands in the pockets and jumping through the second rope. All right, that looked kind of cool. I saw a lot of people raging a couple of weeks ago when it was announced that he was going all elite. You know, I haven't seen enough of him to really formulate an opinion here other than the slow motion crap that he does. That looks trash. It looks stupid. And again, I asked you recently, what the hell does he appear here, appeal here? But in this particular case, it worked. As a kind of a debut, as a surprise, it worked. We'll see what they do with him from there. Uh, if it wasn't this match, though, the other match I thought was really lame on this show. Because at least with the Cracker Barrel Challenge, you had a couple cool things from Darby Allen, and you had the guys at least going out there bumping around. Was Hikaru Shida and Rigo. I hope they said their names right. Um, yeah, this match did not jam for me at all. Maybe it's the style. Maybe it's the fact I don't know who these ladies are. Like, what is so special about them? What is so great about them that I am supposed to care? And when I watched this match, again, they just didn't reel me in. It just didn't work. Like, when I look at the last All Elite show that I watched, it was the first time I had really paid attention to and watched Lucha Effing Soros. Instantly hooked. So even not being that familiar with him didn't automatically mean that I was going to dismiss him. Now I have seen the light. But these two ladies here... Nuh uh. I saw nothing. I saw no appeal. It was just weird. I thought the finish was lame, and the thought that now one, that Riho is going to go on and face Nyla Rose, like legitimately, trans stuff aside for some of you, like you look at Nyla Rose and you look at Riho, and you would say, if Nyla Rose does not squash the brakes off of her, then the whole concept of that title match is stupid. No 50 50 crap. She's a monster. Let her squash Riho's little tiny ass. Just saying. So right there in the middle of the show, I was really starting to tune out a little bit. The show was starting to lose me. And then it brought me back. Sean Spears, Cody Rhodes. I don't know what was with the Star Trek gimmick, but whatever, cool. I'm a Trekkie. No big deal. Just legitimately wondering. I am wondering, however... Why in the hell you would put Pharaoh, your dog, in that type of situation, Cody and Brandy, you stupid motherfuckers? He was not prepared for this. He was not trained for this. You got him the service dog vest crap so he could ride on the flights with you. Whatever. I'm not even going to judge that. But you selfish dicks sit there and bring him out. And then you got Pyro going off. The dog is freaking cowering and mortified. Fuck the both of you. Shame on you. Anyways, moving on to the actual match. When it came to the thing about Sean Spears having Tully Blanchard in his corner, I really wasn't sure what to make of it. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. It's kind of an odd fit. But by God, it really worked here. Tully got in and he did stuff. And it had purpose and it had meaning and it mattered. And as far as MJF being... In Cody Rhodes' corner, you would think it's kind of weird. You've got DDP there. You have paid him to appear. Why wouldn't you have him be the guy that's there? Nonetheless, nonetheless, he wasn't. And I appreciate the fact that while a lot of us did think that they were going to have MJF turn on Cody Rhodes and they teased it after the match was over with the chair, I like the fact that they're doing the slow build. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Just because you could do it now doesn't mean that's the right thing to do. Slow build is a good way to go here. Arguably one of the highlights has to be double A Arn Anderson coming in and hitting Spears with a freaking spine buster. The place went crazy for it. Now sure, Cody ultimately won and we'll go on to see down the road how much booking of his own bullshit he's going to do. I would have liked, frankly, either A, Spears winning this match, 
Or B, even better, if you wanted to tell a better story, in my opinion, instead of having a blow-off here, why not have Cody, when he had the chair in his hands, whack Sean Spears in the freaking head, so that way you could say it's one-to-one -one there, and then at your next show in November, what are you calling it, Full Gear? I don't know about that name. Then you could have those two guys have a big blow-off match. Not every match always needs to have a clean and decisive finish. And it feels like in this particular case, there was more mileage to be gotten out of this. And it's not saying they won't have another match. But it could have left some intrigue and some interest here if you wouldn't have had the blow off here, which is what it felt like. It worked, though, and it got me back into this show. So while Cody Rhodes is a piece of crap and list, 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 fuck Cody Rhodes, you see what I can do? I can put aside personal biases and give credit where credit was due. This match was good. It was entertaining. It wasn't just a pure out, flat out spot fest. Like, I thought the spot that really worked the best. It's amazing. Guys are doing all this other crazy crap on the show. And Spears whipping Cody with a belt and then Cody going off on him. Got as big of a reaction as almost anything that wasn't Arn Anderson on this damn show. Sometimes it's the simple things that make sense. They get the most mileage. And then we get to this ladder match for the AAA Tag Team Championship. And I don't, I don't know about anybody else, but, but I feel weird having said it last night. I still feel weird saying it now. and is a totally, totally true statement. This card, this show, needed this spot fest. It did. Because at least in this case, you had two teams that know how to go out there and do a ladder match. You have two teams that can go out there and do crazy off the wall, over the top shit. And because there is some type of actual story here, because there is some type of rivalry here, it actually really works. Like it gives me the heebie-jeebies in my skin crawling to give the bucks of suck credit here. But again, let it not be said that I can't look past how much I dislike a wrestler or a tag team in this case to give them credit when credit is due. Even with all the Canadian destroyers and all this other crap, it still ultimately worked for me. This match was a hell of a lot of fun. You better record this because you don't know how often I'm going to say this about the Bucks of Suck. But I enjoyed it and I appreciate the fact that when all was said and done, they went out there and did good business and they put over the other tag team. Now you could say it was for another company's tag belt. I don't think the Young Bucks in any way, shape, or form are hurt by losing a match like this. And with this match being second to last on the card, maybe you could make the argument if Meltzer had said that this match should have been like mid-card, like fourth, I could maybe agree with that in terms of the show pacing and the flow. But I'll take it. You know, usually this is, as I get older, it's when I start to tail off into shows, you're already three plus hours into it. I needed this pick-me-up, this adrenaline rush. I like the Lucha Brothers a lot, and this match really worked for me. It was my match of the night. God, that feels weird to say. Then we get to the main event. It was slower than some of the other matches on the show, and it's got Jericho in it. And the story you're trying to tell, it makes sense. It doesn't need to be just a flat-out crash test dummy fest, nor should it be. There should be an attempt to actually try and tell a story here. It's kind of funny to see Hangman Page ride on a horse. Eh? Use whatever you got to try and get you over and make you look like you got personality, but I'm sorry, still boring as bricks to me. But this match probably helped him a little bit. The one thing that was a little odd about this match, though, was Jericho getting busted open. It, the dynamics were just off. Hangman Page is the young upstart. Hangman Page is the one who's trying to get this opportunity of a lifetime. It feels like the story would have worked much better, in my opinion, if Page would have been the one that juiced, if he was the one that bled. It would also be nice if the camera didn't zoom in so closely on girl Hebner handing Jericho the blade. Just saying, just saying. That said though, I did enjoy this match. While sure, it did not have the sheer thrills of Lucha Brothers and Young Bucks, while it did not have that level of pure entertainment value from a shock factor standpoint, 
I appreciated the slow marination and buildup of this match and how Paige would get stuff in, but then Jericho would counter because of his experience and his know-how. I enjoyed it. And you think about it, and as, as a testament to this match and as a testament to Chris Jericho specifically, he carried Hangman Page to by far the best match I've ever seen Page have. And I've seen him have a few matches. Not a ton, mind you, but I've seen enough to say this, this was easily the best match I've seen him have. This match did more to raise the profile of Hangman Page in my eyes, even though he's still quite a ways away from truly being world championship worthy. Chris Jericho got a fucking spinning back elbow over as the finish, and it worked, and the place popped. It erupted. And they did business right. Chris Jericho is your new and first ever All Elite Wrestling World Heavyweight Champion as he should be. There is no argument or debate to be had here. Chris Jericho is the biggest name you have in terms of wrestlers on this roster. You are getting ready to start your two hours of prime time every Wednesday night on TNT. You need star power. You need name recognition. You need name credibility. Chris Jericho being your world champion instantly gives you credibility that, sorry, newsflash, Freaking Hangman Page does not. And if I'm being honest with you, the reality is Kenny Omega doesn't give you that from a larger mainstream perspective. There was only one option. Chris Jericho had to win this match. And we'll see how long he stays a champion. But here's the thing. You can't bring in a legend like Chris Jericho and then just have him job out. That's what WWE had him do too often. It starts to diminish the appeal of when somebody beats him. Because you got to the point with Jericho and WWE fucking Fandango is beating him at WrestleMania. That's too much. It's overboard. Here, you're establishing the legend as a legit legend and the standard bearer and the measuring stick for everybody else in that damn company. And when you are starting out brand new, getting ready to go and sell your company to advertisers to try and draw in more eyeballs... Chris Jericho is the guy that in the short term, you launch your product and you build your brand around. No offense to Hangman Page or anybody else, but uh -uh, he ain't it. And if you think that he would have been the right decision, then God forbid you ever be in charge of a wrestling company or any other business for that matter. Because clearly, your vision for what is needed and what must happen is off. I enjoyed the main event, though. Like I said, I thought it was a good showcase for Hangman Page. It's about the best I've ever seen him look. Jericho was Jericho, and the match ended up sucking me in by the time it was all said and done because at one point in time, I was fearful they were actually going to have Hangman Page win. And by God, they didn't. So, in recap, All Elite Wrestling's All Out. Do I feel like I totally got my $49.99 worth? Mm. Hard for me to quantify that. There was enough good on this show. There were enough people that I could care about to where I said it was worth my time watching a few hours on a Saturday night. And by the way, I do appreciate their pay-per-views being on a Saturday night instead of another company's freaking Sunday night. That I appreciate. I also hope that they stick to the schedule of not doing a pay-per-view every damn month because... That will be nice. I do hope at some point in time they will come up with a different business model than an outdated 50 bucks a pop pay-per-view model because uh, that's going to get a little pricey and a little costly and eventually people like me are going to stop paying for it unless you deliver top-notch product every single time. This was not top-notch product. The commentary sucked at different points in time throughout the night. There wasn't a whole lot to break up the monotony like the vignette package that you had for Wardlow. You know, while you could say it looked a little hokey, it was well produced, and it got me instantly interested in the dude. Could use a little more in terms of interviews and so forth to break up the night. You had a couple of debuts like Lucha Brothers, Young Bucks. You had uh, Santana and Ortiz, LAX appeared. Thought it would have worked better if they would have been in Trump masks, especially since they're repping Puerto Rico so heavy. Small details. There were some different small details throughout the night, at least with the main event girl, Hebner, was actually trying to enforce rules. I love the fact that they had her speak and talk about, I want a good, clean fight and all of this, like you would see in boxing or in some other forms of fighting and entertainment. It worked. 
The show was good. It was not great. It was not terrible. And I'm sorry, but if you hear people say that on other sides of the spectrum, either way, it feels like they're just saying it because they feel like they have to justify a personal opinion one way or another. People are going to rage about this being a great show. It was not. It had its flaws. But it had enough to make me excited a little bit for October 2nd.